liftoff. Liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. The 1986 Challenger disaster stands as one of the darkest days in space exploration. Just moments after launch, the shuttle disintegrated, sending its seven crew members to their fate, either in free fall or upon impact with the Atlantic Ocean. In those harrowing final moments, the astronauts confronted chaos with courage. Their last words echo a profound mix of urgency and hope, capturing the indomitable human spirit in the face of disaster. What were their final thoughts? What desperate measures did they attempt to survive? Join us as we explore the chilling legacy of the Challenger mission and reveal the unforgettable last words of its crew. The Brave Challenger Crew Members on July 19, 1985, a life-changing letter arrived for Krista McAuliffe, a dedicated schoolteacher from Concord, New Hampshire. She had been selected from a pool of over 11,000 applicants to become the first teacher in space, a role that would ignite not just her personal dreams, but a nationwide sense of inspiration. McAuliffe's selection for NASA's Teacher in Space project was a pivotal moment, not only for her, but also for educators and students across the country. This historic opportunity was set to bridge the gap between Earth and space in a way never done before by bringing space exploration into classrooms. McAuliffe's selection was met with excitement and pride at her school, Concord High School and beyond. It wasn't just about her personal journey, it was about inspiring an entire generation of students and teachers. Her mission was to conduct live lessons from space captivating the imaginations of students nationwide. After her return, she planned to embark on a lecture tour across the country, sharing her experiences and lessons with thousands of eager listeners. In many ways, Krista McAuliffe wasn't just a passenger aboard the Challenger. She was a symbol of educational progress, science, and the limitless potential of human exploration. The possibility became very real, and I really started to think what the impact would be on my teaching career and on my family, yeah. but it was still really exciting. Joining McAuliffe was an experienced and highly qualified team of astronauts. Commander Francis R. Scobie, a seasoned pilot, had already demonstrated his skills on previous space missions. His co-pilot, Michael J. Smith, was no stranger to complex flights, having flown a variety of aircraft with distinction. Astronaut Judith A. Resnick, another member of the crew, had already made history with her pioneering work at NASA, breaking barriers for women in space. Ronald E. McNair, the second African-American in space, brought his expertise and unique perspective to the team, while Ellison S. Onizuka, the first Asian-American astronaut, was set to make his own mark on history. Rounding out the crew was Gregory B. Jarvis, a payload specialist, ready to carry out vital experiments aboard the shuttle. The Challenger crew represented the best of America's space program, a diverse group of trailblazers who were fully prepared for the mission ahead. Yet beneath the excitement and pride, there were subtle warning signs that would later prove devastating. Their mission, which had once promised to be a landmark in history, was heading toward a tragic end that no one could have anticipated. The Space Shuttle The Space Shuttle, NASA's groundbreaking spacecraft, had revolutionized space exploration since its debut flight in April 1981. Unlike earlier spacecraft, the shuttle was designed to be partially reusable, making space travel more sustainable. It consisted of three main components, the orbiter, the external fuel tank, ET, and two solid rocket boosters, SRBs. The orbiter, the heart of the shuttle, housed the crew and carried the payload, while the SRBs provided the power needed to propel the shuttle into orbit. Once in space, the shuttle's smaller orbital maneuvering system, OMS engines, allowed it to navigate with precision. The Challenger, formerly designated OV-099, was the second orbiter constructed in NASA's shuttle fleet. Initially built as a test vehicle, it was converted into an operational spacecraft, playing a key role in several missions. Its design, while innovative, required constant maintenance and repairs due to the extreme wear and tear of space travel. Over the course of its missions, the Challenger had been subjected to harsh conditions that stressed its components, including its SRBs, 
which were vital for both launch and re-entry. Despite the shuttle's numerous successes, there were vulnerabilities in its design, particularly the O-rings that sealed the segments of the SRBs. These seals were crucial for preventing the escape of hot gases during launch, but they were also highly sensitive to temperature fluctuations. Little did anyone know, the wear and tear accumulated from previous missions, combined with specific environmental conditions, would soon lead to a catastrophic failure. The space shuttle, once a symbol of national pride and technological advancement, was on the brink of a disaster that would change the course of space exploration forever. Unheeded warnings and the delay. While the Challenger's crew prepared for their mission, the spacecraft itself was sending subtle signals that all was not well. NASA engineers had long been aware of potential risks, but their warnings often went unheeded. As early as two years before the Challenger disaster, engineers had raised concerns about the O-rings on the SRBs. These rubber seals were designed to expand and contract with temperature changes, but there was mounting evidence that cold weather could compromise their integrity. The Challenger crew's original launch date was set for January 22, 1986, but this was delayed due to the return of Shuttle Mission 61C, which encountered unforeseen problems. The delay frustrated the Challenger crew, eager to embark on their historic journey. For seasoned astronauts, delays were nothing new, but this postponement brought a sense of unease. NASA's delay culture wasn't uncommon. Missions were often postponed due to a range of technical and logistical issues. Yet, for Challenger, the timing of this delay would ultimately prove deadly. It allowed the cold front moving across Florida to settle in, setting the stage for the fateful day when temperatures would drop to levels previously unseen during shuttle launches. Concern about weather and O-rings. As the new launch date of January 28, 1986 approached, NASA faced a troubling forecast, record low temperatures for the Kennedy Space Center. Overnight, temperatures dropped to an unprecedented 18 degrees Fahrenheit and were expected to rise only slightly by launch time. Such conditions were well outside the typical range for shuttle launches, and engineers, particularly those from Morton Thiokol, the company responsible for manufacturing the SRBs, voiced their growing concerns. At the heart of these concerns were the O-rings. The cold weather threatened to reduce their elasticity, making them less capable of expanding to form the proper seal during ignition. Engineers from Morton Theocol had previously observed signs of erosion on the O-rings during warmer launches, and they feared that the freezing conditions on the morning of January 28th could result in catastrophic failure. A conference call was convened on the evening of January 27th to discuss the issue. Engineers from Morton Theocol, led by Vice President Robert Lund, urged NASA to postpone the launch, citing their inability to guarantee the O-ring's performance in such cold weather. And he said, Al, he says, we've just been notified that some meteorologist in, in Orlando said, you know, these strong winds... That but despite their warnings, the decision was made to proceed. NASA management, under pressure to meet deadlines and avoid further delays, dismissed the engineers' concerns as inconclusive. The decision to launch made in the face of credible warnings would become one of the most controversial aspects of the Challenger disaster. At the time, NASA's culture was deeply rooted in optimism and confidence in its technological capabilities, but this culture also fostered a sense of invincibility that would have fatal consequences. The engineers' warnings were brushed aside and the launch was given the green light. As the sun rose on January 28, 1986, the crew of the Challenger shuttle prepared to embark on their mission, unaware of the tragic fate that awaited them. Despite the freezing temperatures and the unaddressed concerns about the O-rings, NASA's final decision was to proceed. Two hours and 38 minutes later, disaster would strike. The Launch Day As the scheduled launch hour approached, a vibrant crowd gathered around Cape Canaveral, a melting pot of spectators, journalists, and space enthusiasts. Among them were local residents, international press, and visitors who had traveled great distances for this extraordinary event. This wasn't just another launch. It was a moment of history in the making. Two, one, and liftoff. Liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle mission. The inclusion of Krista McAuliffe, a teacher selected to be the first civilian in space, amplified the excitement surrounding the mission. Her journey represented a dream realized, captivating the hearts of many, 
especially educators and students across the nation. This launch was especially significant, marking the 25th flight of NASA's Space Shuttle program, with Challenger embarking on its 10th mission, a testament to its reliable track record. As the astronauts donned their spacesuits, a wave of cheers erupted from the crowd. Their smiles and waves projected confidence and determination as they stepped out of their transport vehicle heading toward the waiting elevator that would take them to the cockpit of the Challenger. Behind the scenes, mission control in Houston was a hub of activity, where hundreds of sensors worked tirelessly, relaying a steady stream of data to ensure the shuttle was primed for launch. Seated in the cockpit, Commander Francis Scobie and pilot Michael Smith conducted final checks, their excitement mingling with the weight of anticipation. They were on the cusp of realizing a long-held dream, with the world watching in awe. On board, the Challenger carried vital scientific equipment, including the tracking and data relay satellite TDRS and the Spartan Halley spacecraft intended for deployment. However, the execution of these experiments would soon be jeopardized. After a weather-related delay, the skies cleared and preparations resumed. As the countdown began, a symphony of instruments came to life, and the steady voice of mission control echoed through the cockpit. Ten, nine, eight, each number heightened the tension and focus in the air. The roar of the solid rocket boosters ignited with a powerful thrust, shaking the ground and reverberating through the hearts of those watching. With a booming announcement of liftoff, the Challenger ascended majestically, leaving a trail of fire and smoke in its wake. Mission and it has cleared the tower. It symbolized human ingenuity reaching for the stars. As the crowd below erupted in cheers, the shuttle's journey had officially begun, heralding a year filled with promising missions ahead. Crew's Final Words In the final moments before disaster struck, the crew maintained a calm and professional demeanor, engaged in light banter and work. NASA's transcript reveals the crew's interactions during those crucial last five minutes. Four crew members, Commander Scobie, Pilot Smith, and Mission Specialists Ellison Onizuka and Judith Resnick, shared a mix of professionalism and humor, joking about instrument readings and the shuttle's systems. Just over three minutes before liftoff, the crew made small confirmations and observations. Onizuka's playful quip about the shuttle's oxygen vent cap elicited laughter, showcasing their camaraderie. As the countdown progressed, Pilot Smith's spirited remark, Go, you mother, when prompted to roll the shuttle, added a human touch to the tension-filled atmosphere. At 1 minute and 10 seconds into the flight, Commander Scobie instructed Smith to throttle up. Just three seconds later, Smith's chilling uh-oh echoed through the cabin, marking the last communication before silence fell. This brief moment of recognition hinted at their awareness of something going awry, a gut feeling that would soon be tragically confirmed. The audio transcript, recovered later from the Atlantic Ocean, pieced together their final moments, shedding light on the crew's composed behavior amidst the unfolding disaster. Their professionalism was palpable, even as the storm of catastrophe loomed just out of sight. The Tragic Crash A mere 73 seconds into the flight, the Challenger, filled with power and ambition, was suddenly transformed into a vessel of tragedy. Flames erupted from a failing seal on the right booster, signaling the start of a catastrophic explosion. The crew's calm voices filled mission control, unaware of the impending disaster. What started as a promising mission swiftly descended into chaos. Initially, everything appeared normal as the main engines roared to life, confirming a successful launch at 10.04 a.m. However, a sense of unease grew when a data blackout occurred shortly after liftoff. Ground observers noticed unusual black smoke billowing from the right booster near a critical O-ring seal, but neither the crew nor mission control fully grasped the gravity of the situation. The black smoke was a telltale sign of hot gases leaking from a compromised O-ring, a flaw exacerbated by the unusually cold temperatures on launch day. Despite the alarming visual evidence, routine procedures continued as the crew proceeded with their tasks. Launch commentator Hugh Harris's voice, announcing that the shuttle had cleared the tower, provided a a momentary sense of reassurance, momentarily overshadowing the troubling signs. Engines at 65 percent, three engines uh, running normally, three good fuel cells. However, at 1044, technicians observed a concerning anomaly. 
a slightly elevated internal pressure reading in the right booster. This subtle indication was a precursor to the disaster that lay ahead. Despite these ominous signs, the crew continued, executing a roll maneuver that positioned the Challenger for its mission. Then, at 11.27 a.m., just 19 seconds after liftoff, the moment of horror arrived. The Challenger lurched violently, a moment of chaos erupting as Pilot Smith fought to regain control. With remarkable composure, he momentarily stabilized the spacecraft, but this brief respite was deceptive. As they approached 10,000 feet, Commander Scobie reported a troubling visibility issue from his window, an ominous signal that foreshadowed the impending catastrophe. At 12.01, as the Challenger hurtled through the sound barrier, all seemed normal, yet a storm was brewing beneath the surface. Instrument readings continued to portray a facade of stability, but the true extent of the disaster was hidden. Moments later, at 12.53, a brilliant flash near the right wing ignited a wave of panic among the spectators. A colossal fireball erupted from the failing booster, marking the point of no return. Despite the visible signs of catastrophe, the internal gauges still painted a picture of normalcy, lulling the crew into a false sense of security. One minute, 15 seconds. Velocity, 2,900 feet per second. Altitude, 9 nautical miles. Downrange distance, 7 nautical miles. As the Challenger accelerated to over 1,500 miles per hour, Commander Scobie's calm decision to throttle down seemed to restore order, but this calm was illusory. At 1.46 into the flight, the critical O-ring seal suffered catastrophic failure, initiating a chain reaction that engulfed the right side of the shuttle in flames. In that haunting moment, the crew confronted the grim reality of their situation, a tragic transformation from explorers to victims. As the Challenger was consumed by the Inferno, the crew initiated emergency procedures in a desperate attempt to regain control. However, the shuttle had become a doomed vessel, racing toward an inescapable fate. At 74 seconds into their mission, it was clear that their aspirations had morphed into a struggle for survival. The cabin remained intact for a brief moment, but the rapid loss of atmospheric pressure rendered the crew unconscious, their hopes extinguished in the face of unimaginable peril. In the months that followed, search teams painstakingly recovered the wreckage, confirming the heartbreaking fate of the Challenger crew. Analysis of the Wreckage The tragedy of the Challenger disaster remains one of the most harrowing moments in space exploration history. When the crew cabin, constructed from reinforced aluminum, detached from the orbiter, it followed a ballistic trajectory that took it to approximately 65,000 feet above the Earth's surface just 25 seconds after the explosion. This was a moment of both despair and intrigue, as investigators sought to understand what happened in those final moments. At the moment of separation, the crew cabin experienced an intense acceleration estimated to be between 12 and 20 times the force of gravity. Remarkably, within just two seconds, this acceleration dropped below 4G and within 10 seconds, the cabin entered a state of free fall. The forces exerted during this phase were likely insufficient to cause significant injury to the crew, leading to chilling evidence suggesting that at least some of them were alive and conscious following the breakup. Pilot Michael Smith and two other unidentified crew members activated their personal egress air packs, PEAPS, an action that indicated a desperate attempt to secure their survival. Notably, Commander Richard Scobie did not activate his PEAP, suggesting either a lack of awareness or a failure to act amidst the chaos. Investigators found that Smith's PEAP had been activated by one of his crewmates, likely either Ellison Onizuka or Krista McAuliffe, pointing to a collective effort to survive against overwhelming odds. Further examination of the wreckage revealed disturbing details about the moments leading up to the explosion. Several electrical system switches on Smith's right-hand panel had been moved from their standard launch positions. These switches were equipped with lever locks, which meant that they could not have been displaced by the explosion or the impact with the ocean. This evidence suggested that Smith may have attempted to manipulate these switches in a futile effort to restore electrical power to the cockpit after the crew cabin had detached. As investigators delved deeper, they uncovered the brutal fate that awaited the crew when the cabin collided with the ocean. The sheer force and pressure of this impact resulted in catastrophic destruction, making the recovery of intact bodies nearly impossible. But with the recovery of the crew compartment, 
In the wake of the tragedy, a comprehensive three-month search and recovery operation was launched, involving multiple agencies and extensive resources. Recovery efforts were initially hampered by the danger of falling debris from the explosion, leading to a cautious approach. By 12.37 p.m., the operation began to ramp up, involving two SRB recovery ships, MV Freedom Star and MV Liberty Star, deployed to the impact zone to collect debris. As the operation unfolded, the scale of recovery efforts expanded, encompassing 12 aircraft and 8 ships, all working diligently to retrieve what remained of the Challenger. Surface operations to recover debris from the orbiter and external tank concluded on February 7. Subsequently, the U.S. Navy initiated submarine recovery operations, prioritizing the retrieval of the Wright Solid Rocket Booster SRB followed by the crew compartment and other payload components. Formal debris search efforts began on February 8, led by the rescue and salvage ship USS Preserver, utilizing side-scan sonar to cover an area of 486 square nautical miles at depths ranging from 70 to 1,200 feet. This extensive search identified 881 potential debris locations, with 187 confirmed to be from the orbiter itself. The recovered material, though fragmented and crushed, told a harrowing story of the disaster's ferocity. By March 7, Air Force divers identified what appeared to be crew compartment debris, later confirmed by divers from the USS Preserver. While the cabin had largely remained intact during the explosion, it sustained devastating damage upon hitting the ocean, further complicating recovery efforts. The remains of the crew were severely damaged by both the impact and the submersion, making identification incredibly challenging. Traditional methods such as fingerprints or dental records proved ineffective due to the state of the recovered materials. Despite these obstacles, scientists worked tirelessly to identify remains belonging to all seven crew members. Though the extent of the damage made it impossible to ascertain the exact cause of death for any of them. The USS Preserver played a crucial role in transporting debris and remains to port continuing recovery operations until April 4th. A tragic incident occurred when astronaut Jarvis's body drifted away, only to be located weeks later on April 15th. Upon arrival at port, pathologists faced legal disputes over the transfer of human remains for autopsies, complicating the already delicate situation. Ultimately, NASA officials made the unprecedented decision to release the death certificates for the crew members. Throughout the recovery process, significant findings related to the spacecraft's components emerged. Percent. Normal throttles uh, for most of the flight, 104 percent. The inertial upper stage, IUS, intended to boost the orbit of the TDSB satellite, was among the first pieces of debris recovered. Surprisingly, there was no evidence of premature ignition of the IUS which had been a suspected cause of the disaster. Between February 14th and 28th, debris from the three Space Shuttle main engines, SSMEs, was also retrieved, revealing a scenario consistent with functional engines suddenly losing their liquid hydrogen fuel supply. Deep water recovery operations continued until April 29th, with smaller scale shallow recovery efforts extending until August 29th. A significant discovery occurred on December 17, 1996, when two pieces of the orbiter were found at Cocoa Beach. More recently, on November 10, 2022, NASA announced the discovery of a 20-foot piece of the shuttle off the coast of Florida, a finding that generated renewed interest and was featured on the History Channel. Almost all recovered non-organic debris from Challenger is now interred in missile silos at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. NASA's Response in the aftermath of the Challenger disaster, NASA took decisive action to not only address the tragedy, but also to enhance the safety and reliability of the Space Shuttle program. Recognizing the critical need for improvements, a significant initiative was launched to redesign the Solid Rocket Boosters (SRBs), which were subsequently referred to as the Redesigned Solid Rocket Motor (RSMR). This redesign was overseen by an independent oversight group dedicated to ensuring that the lessons learned from the incident were applied to future missions. One of the key improvements involved modifying the joint structure of the SRBs to include a capture feature on the tang around the interior wall of the clevis. This modification aimed to prevent joint rotation, 
thereby reducing the risk of O-ring seal failure, a critical factor in the Challenger disaster. Additionally, heaters were installed to maintain consistent higher temperatures for the O-rings, further enhancing their performance and reliability under operational conditions. Beyond the redesign of the SRBs, NASA implemented stringent safety standards across all components of the Space Shuttle program. Notably, an escape option was introduced, allowing astronauts to jettison the side hatch and extend a pole out of the orbiter. This innovation enabled crew members to slide down the pole to safety, mitigating the risk of collision with the orbiter as they activated their parachutes. In response to the recommendations from the commission investigating the incident, NASA established a new Office of Safety, Reliability, and Quality Assurance in 1986. This proactive measure underscored NASA's commitment to enhancing safety protocols and ensuring the integrity of the Space Shuttle program moving forward. The organization focused on promoting a culture of safety within NASA and fostering an environment where potential risks could be identified and mitigated effectively. These comprehensive changes reflected a deep commitment to learning from the tragic loss of the Challenger crew. NASA aimed to honor their memory by ensuring that no such disaster would occur again. The agency became more transparent in its operations, welcoming external reviews and audits to ensure adherence to safety standards. NASA's response also included increased training for astronauts and ground personnel, emphasizing emergency procedures and the importance of communication during high-stress situations. Enhanced simulations were developed to prepare the crew for potential emergencies, ensuring they were better equipped to handle unforeseen challenges. The tragedy of Challenger served as a somber reminder of the inherent risks of space exploration, but it also galvanized a renewed commitment to safety and excellence within NASA. The changes implemented in the wake of the disaster not only improved the shuttle program, but also set a standard for future endeavors in space exploration. Burial Legacy on April 29, 1986, the remains of the Challenger astronauts were transported via a C-141 Starlifter aircraft from Kennedy Space Center to the military mortuary at Dover Air Force Base in Delaware. Each casket was draped with an American flag and accompanied by an honor guard, a solemn tribute to the sacrifice these brave individuals made for the advancement of humanity's understanding of space. Upon arrival at Dover, the remains were handed over to the families of the crew members, who had to navigate their grief amid a very public tragedy. The final resting places for the astronauts varied, reflecting the unique legacies of each individual. Richard Scobie and Michael Smith were laid to rest at Arlington National Cemetery, while Ellison Onizuka found his final resting place at the National Memorial Cemetery of the Pacific in Honolulu, Hawaii. Ronald McNair was interred at Rest Lawn Memorial Park in Lake City, South Carolina, before being moved to the Dr. Ronald E. McNair Memorial Park. Krista McAuliffe's remains were buried at Calvary Cemetery in Concord, New Hampshire, while Judith Resnick's remains were cremated and scattered over the water. Lastly, Francis R. Jarvis was also cremated, with his ashes scattered in the Pacific Ocean. Unidentified crew remains were interred at the Space Shuttle Challenger Memorial in Arlington, serving as a unified tribute to their sacrifice. On May 20, 1986, a single grave marker was dedicated at Arlington National Cemetery, serving as a permanent memorial honoring the seven astronauts and ensuring their contributions to space exploration are remembered as a collective. This solemn marker signifies their unity as a crew, with their spirits forever connected as they soar among the stars. The Challenger disaster profoundly impacted the nation, and the names of the crew members became synonymous with bravery and sacrifice. In recognition of their contributions, the Challenger Learning Center was established, providing educational opportunities for students to inspire future generations to pursue careers in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics (STEM). In the years following the tragedy, the memory of the Challenger crew has continued to inspire and shape the future of space exploration. The commitment to safety and the pursuit of knowledge that emerged from the disaster serves as a guiding principle for NASA and the broader scientific community. The legacy of these brave astronauts endures, a reminder of the courage it takes to push the boundaries of human achievement. In memory of the seven brave astronauts we lost, we'll wrap up today's story. If this powerful tale inspired you or taught you something new, share your thoughts in the comments. For more unforgettable stories, make sure to subscribe to our channel.